Hello and welcome to the video for Wednesday, October 14th, Game Design. I'm going to open up the waiting room and let them in. Boom. Hello there. Maybe that hello was a little early for people. We're still jumping in. Hey, Hi, El Kenobi. Yeah. Hey, hello. How are you doing? Doing good. Hello. Good. All right, let me type a little welcome message into the chat here. Uh, okay. Hope you guys are doing well and having a good day. Yeah. Anybody play any cool games lately? Uh, Splunky 2. Yeah, is that good? Yeah, I think it's good. I like the original. I think it, I like it. Nice. I actually got my old Wii out, and I've been playing some of the um, Wii games we have. Oh, really? Is that fun? Hell yeah. I used to like play it a bunch when I was a little kid, but it's just been kind of gathering dust for a while. But getting back on it is definitely lots of fun. Plus, I mean, I guess it's exercise if you're swinging the Wii mode around. We had, uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, my brother had a Commodore 64, one of the first um commercial computers available and then uh then he got um an amiga computer and the amigas were great they uh i mean the graphics you guys would laugh at the graphics they were just so chunky and slow and everything and i think the amiga had like 128 uh you know megabytes of memory which was like a huge amount at the time but um my brother kept the computer i, I still have it uh, and th there were all kinds of uh, weird games on that uh, computer and you could make music on it and it still works. That's what I love about that computer. You can still plug it in and it still works. So uh, it's definitely worth keeping old, old systems, whether they're computers or gaming systems, if, if you can break them out again and have fun with them. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, definitely. Like I got a bunch of hand-me-down equipment from my two older brothers and stuff. So we, we have all their Xbox games and their Xbox 360 games still. That's so cool. That's fun, man. There have been so many different consoles and everything. I can't even believe it. Like all the different games that have come and gone and all the different cartridges. And I mean, what do you guys think? Do you like, do you like, uh, do you still like playing uh, console games or do you prefer um, computer-based games? What do you think? I mostly play computer now. Yeah. Is it just easier than getting all the different consoles and continually upgrading and stuff? Yeah. Also, I like to play alone, and uh, our I have four siblings, so it's a little difficult to do that if out on the TV. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hear you, man. Four siblings is a lot. I have three, and that was plenty, so I can't even imagine four. Um, I six. <laughs> You have six? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That is too many. Too many. Uh, yeah, that's intense. Well, I guess we all have different experiences when it comes to that. Um, okay, well, let me get you guys in the attendance here, and then we will get started. So, gamer.drinker.com, game design. Okay. Doing this and then blah, blah blah okay and then back to here and then look okay all right okay so i'm not sure if we'll have a presentation today or not because uh the student who's on the list is not here yet so we'll see if they come in and if they have one ready but in the meantime i'm going to share my screen and um show you guys a couple things here share the screen okay uh, first thing I want to show you was this because just because I think it's cool. So this is just one of those memes uh, on GIFCAT. And what it was titled was, hey, I'm working on a game where uh, there's a village on the back of a giant moving creature. <laughs> I just thought, man, this is such a cool idea. That's so sick. I swear, I think I just saw this on Reddit. The other day. Kind of reminds me of Kronos. I think that's its name from God of War. Um, yes. Yeah. 
it's a walking mountain or something like that yeah it's just a cool idea i like the idea i like the graphics and i thought it was kind of fun so i thought i'd share that with you guys um okay and then the other thing can you is, guys hear me uh let's see let me go back here okay there we go uh so there, here's an article for you guys uh to check out and read in your own time um So this is a story on Mel Magazine about E.T., the true story behind the worst video game ever made. Um, it says, Atari's 1982 E.T. game was so disastrous, it's been blamed for the company's downfall and the crash of the entire industry. The man responsible for the game, however, has taken it surprisingly well. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. I, I read a little bit about it and... Um, the, you know, the designer apparently was given a ridiculously short amount of time to create this game. Um, and, you know, they basically said something to him like uh, he had just literally just finished one other game and, and somebody at the company said to him, hey, we've got, uh, we've got you booked on a plane to go see Steven uh, in two days. And he wants to, you know, he wants you to work on a game for his new movie. And, and the guy's like, Steven, they're like, yes, yeah, Steven Spielberg. So this guy had to, you know, create all the concepts and everything that he was going to present to Steven Spielberg in an incredibly short period of time. He flew over there and just, you know, presented this stuff to him and Spielberg said, looks great, you know, and then he had to go and he had to create the whole thing in, you know, an extremely truncated period of time. And as a result, it was just a disaster. And then, you know, all the things that followed. So it's, it's pretty interesting, pretty fun, uh, you know, to learn about the best and the worst of anything. So this is a, this is an interesting article if you guys are interested. Um, okay, let me double check and make sure that nobody came in who is this guy. Okay, no, nobody's there. Okay, so uh, let's see. Now, I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit. I wanted to present a, a little information from the textbook challenges and then take a look at whatever you guys have done with your games. So let me switch over here to the textbook um, and let me go, uh, this little highlight here, it represents where we left off. And now I just have to try and get it at the top of my page, which is harder than it looks. Okay, so we are in chance, we're talking about chance. And right now this chapter is called the mechanics of chance. And there's some interesting things to know about dice. Now, do any of you guys play a Catan or have you played Catan? No, I haven't. Okay, um, so Catan, one of the features of Catan or Settlers of Catan is that you have these numbers which represent the probability of dice rolls. And you put those numbers at uh, different places of the board. And then if you roll that number, you know, there's benefits to you. If you, if you get that number, you can place objects, you know, on certain tiles. Um, and so it's pretty clever that they, that the designers of that game actually thought about the probabilities, introduced them into the game and made it part of the game, right? But a lot of us don't think about probability when we're designing games. We're just like, okay, we need, we need randomness in this game. So we're gonna use dice or perhaps cards. Well, so let's talk about dice for a second. It says dice comes, or dice come in many shapes and sizes. You know, standard dice of course have six sides. And then we have all our, what you might call your D&D &D dice, you know, the 4, 8, 10, 12, 20, 30, or even 100-sided dice. And by the way, just as an aside here, if you're designing a game that has some weird requirements like uh, a 25-sided dice, they exist. I actually, I was, uh, that was happening to me. I designed a game that was basically all these um, hexagon tiles, you know, put together in circles. And you know, as each circle got bigger, it came out to a weird number like 64 or 13, or I don't remember what they were. But I was like, you know, I was trying to get my, my players to roll dice that would put them somewhere in these different circles. And so I had to find like a, an 18 sided dice and a 25 sided die and it was just weird. But anyway, I looked on the internet and they exist, you know? And you know, of course you pay more for them because they're, they're a rarity. But if you ever have needs like that, um, then they're out there. Okay, anyway, um, it says, uh, rolling a single die creates a random number between one and the number of faces on the die. 
with each number having an equal chance of being rolled. Rolling a 1d10, a single 10-sided die, has an equal chance of producing any value from 1 to 10. As such, rolling a single die is about as random as you can get. Now that all makes sense to us. That's all the way we think about die, but here's the really interesting point. By rolling multiple dice and adding them together, the result is no longer equally random. The numbers in the middle are rolled more frequently while the numbers at the extreme ends are rolled only rarely. Um, the frequency of rolls becomes similar to the bell curve. For example, when rolling 2d6, two six-sided die, the most common roll is seven, uh, while the least common are two and 12. So the ones at the extremes, uh, you know, two sixes, two ones are less common, but hitting a three and a four or a five and a two uh, more common, right? And of course, gambling, you know, takes advantage of, the, of this fact. Um, let's see, the more dice involved, the more heavily uh, the results skew towards the center. So you have to think about that. Like if you design a, a die game and you want it to be truly random or you design a game and you want the die to be used to create a random number, well, you gotta, you gotta roll just one die for it to truly be random within the space of how many faces there are. Uh, if you roll two, then you have to design your game in such a way that to know that, that uh, more often the numbers are gonna be in the center of, of the, you know, adding those two numbers together, uh, you know, the two sixes and less often on the, the two and 12. Um, so, uh, and, and then of course, don't think that, you know, oh, well, we have three things that they have to, we have three random numbers that have to be generated. Don't think that, that having them roll more dice is going to create more randomness. It'll actually create less randomness uh, because it'll increase the skew towards the center of the numbers. So that's just the math, the probabilities involved, right? Now it says, uh, let me go down a little bit here. It says dice are one of the few random mechanics where previous results do not influence future ones. No matter how many times 1d8 is rolled, the next roll still has an equal chance of being anywhere between one and eight. Even if the previous 10 rolls were all five, there's still exactly a one in eight chance that the next roll will be five also, no more or no less. Now, this is really interesting. This is, you know, you've probably heard about all the fallacies that gamblers believe. And um, here's one now. Gamblers often ignore this fact and, is, and assume that the dice are either hot or cold, a fallacy that game designers cannot afford to make. Well, this may seem contrary to the bell curve discussed in the previous paragraph. Keep in mind that an individual roll merely has a probability of rolling certain numbers, not a certainty. Previous rolls never uh, influence future ones. So just the, you know, just the idea that a gambler is on a lucky streak or a cold streak is ludicrous because it doesn't exist. You know, the probabilities just exist as math. You know, they're, they're, they're not connected to our emotions or our luck. Okay, so that's some interesting stuff about dice. You know, consider that when you're designing your games. Now let's talk about cards and how versatile they are. Cards are wonderfully versatile game elements. They can be shuffled, randomizing their order. They can be played face down on the table, making their information hidden from all players. They can also be dealt to players who can only look at their own cards and no one else's, giving each player privileged information. Um, cards can be used as resources, either by being kept in a hand, in a pile, or played in an area in front of an individual player. They can also be used to track game information without adding randomness. People have even used cards as projectiles to determine a starting location. I think that's pretty funny. Can you imagine your game starting out by everybody like flicking a card to see where they start? You know, it's kind of weird. I always think of like, uh, I, there was that, uh, there was that guy in, there was a guy in uh, a James Bond film uh, who, who used to have this hat that he could fling and, uh, and it would kill people, you know, it would like slice their heads off and stuff like that. I always think about that in regards to cards, like you could have these cards that would like slice people. Just slice someone up. <laughs> Just their head right off their neck. Yeah, that would be the game, you know, it's like, okay, it's a murder game and your only weapon are cards and you have to like, yeah. uh. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, since there's a finite number of cards included with any game, revealing a card affects the probability of other cards. That makes sense, right? For example, in the gambling game Blackjack, a higher proportion of face cards in the remaining deck favors the players. Fewer face cards favor the dealer. The ratio of face cards to other cards changes over time as more cards are dealt out of a deck. If a player receives 10 face cards in a row, 
probability of getting another decreases, unlike dice. So, you know, face cards uh, are actually cards in general, uh, you know, the probabilities change, unlike dice, where if you roll one die, it's always the same probability. Probabilities are reset when all the cards are collected and reshuffled. Some card games even include a card that forces the deck to be reshuffled immediately when it is drawn, a way of randomly varying the amount of randomness in the deck. Note that if the deck is reshuffled after every draw, drawing a single card from a deck of N cards is equivalent to rolling a die with N sides. So the bottom line, the more often you reshuffle the deck, the more you know, your prob probabilities get closer to zero, right? But you have to think about this fact when you create card games, how much information are you gonna give the players or games with cards, I should say. You know, um, for example, uh, Creed in your game, you know, if, if, if there are these little monsters that your guys fight, you know, uh, I forget what's the name for your little monster, Mex, is it Mex? Yeah, yeah, so that's like, cause we play as like Cthulhu monsters and we fight like robots, basically mini Mex. Okay, so if a player had the information about how many Mex existed in the deck or how many, you know, if there was some upper limit on how many could, could attack them in a round or something like that, they could use that that information just like somebody in poker would would use the information of counting cards to see the the changing probabilities, right? Yeah, right. So you have to decide, you know, um, if you're going to provide players with that information, how it's going to change the game. You know, certainly they can read the rules and they can see how many are are in a deck, or you know, how many how many mechs were added to the game. Period. But you know you could change that by randomly shuffling the deck and taking half the deck away. You know what I mean? So right. um, you know you, you have to consider that when you're when you're including cards in a game. Um, okay, so let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, that's the end of the card section. All right, now this is interesting. Uh, pseudo random number generators. So we all think of computers as being able to generate random numbers, right? Um, you know in video games or whatever, it says for all their processing powers, computers are still driven by non-random instructions. It is impossible for most computers to produce a truly random number. However, there are plenty of algorithms in common use for computers to produce what is geekily called a pseudo random number, a number that is technically not random, but that is close enough uh, for the purposes of most games. So, you know, if you're being a purist, it's not a random number, but it's close enough, right? Yeah, it's so funny. I'm in a, I'm also in a programming class, and we were just having a whole discussion about like, can you actually create a random number with a program? And the consensus was that you cannot. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind yeah. of interesting. So, but for the general public, if you say random number generator, they're just going to buy it, you know, and 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 who cares because right. it's close enough, right? Close enough. Yeah, exactly. It's close enough. Yeah. Um, Okay, hidden information. Now, remember, I always refer to chess and Go as the games that have no hidden information. Everything's on the field, right? But every other game has some inf hidden information. And the more hidden information there is, the more it affects the outcome of the game. Like you think about a game like Secret Hitler or something where nobody knows who Hitler is except Hitler, right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of information that's hidden in that game. Um, when non-random non information is concealed from the players, it is still random from the player's perspective. For example, in the children's card game Go Fish, a player must ask another player for a card of a chosen type. Without any further information, this starts out as a random guess, even though the cards in the opponent's hands are not random as far as the opponent is concerned. They know exactly what they have. RTS games often include a fog of war that conceals information about what the opponents are building. Even without any other randomness, the uncertainty of how best to respond to the unknown threats creates random dynamics. Similar dynamics are seen in rock, paper, scissors, especially if played against a pseudo random number generator instead of a human. When hidden information is also random, such as a weapon that deals a completely unknown amount of random damage, there is the danger of the player becoming confused or frustrated. Players should be able to understand the consequences of their actions and be able to form some degree of strategy that takes into account the random elements of the game. If the systems are hidden from them, their task of understanding the game is much more difficult. When making a game, especially a video game, designers are careful when including a random mechanic that is not displayed to the player. 
So this this comes into the fact that when, when players play games, they want to feel like they have some sense of uh, being able to control their own destiny, right? Now, they really can't because as been said, as has been said in the past, when you're playing a game, there's two people present, you and the designer, right? And that designer has done their best to create a game that will be enjoyable to you, but will also take into account meaningful choices that you get to make. In other words, your self-fulfilling destiny versus random events that just happen to you, some of which are good or some are, are bad. Now, if you have a game where too many random uncontrollable events happen to people, they'll start to feel that sense of, you know, um, of power slipping away from them. Um, you know, the, the meaningful decisions. If they, if, you know, if, if your game is too far over here to randomness and not enough towards strategy, then they feel disempowered and they're not, it's not enjoyable. And you might also consider the age of the players. Like, you know, if players are very young, very young children, uh, you know, then randomness is a big part of what's going on because may, they may not have the skills or the experience to make strategic choices. But as the age, as you age, uh, people, people require uh, and get more thrill out of strategy. You know, um, they, they want to be able to, uh, to be part of the decision-making process and to control their fate, right? You know, you don't get a lot of four-year-olds screaming to their mom that they want to play chess, right? They want to play shoots and ladders. Um, okay, so let's pick this back up. So, um, okay. Other game bits. Uh, most other forms of randomness are variants of the above. Spinners, often found in children's board games where you spin an arrow and see where points behave just like dice. Flipping a coin is essentially the same as rolling a two-sided die. A dreidel, uh, pictured right here, produces the same results as a four-sided die. Cardboard tiles drawn from a bag, popular with many European games such as Carcassonne and Tigris and Euphrates, provide similar randomness to a deck of cards. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about randomness and then we'll take, or about chance, and then we'll, we'll take a look at uh, any new stuff that you guys have to share with us in your games. So all randomness is not created equal. Consider this question, is poker a game of luck or a game of skill? What do you guys think? Both. Both? Yeah, yeah, I think both, I guess. I say skill because if you're really good at like card counting, then you can basically kind of know what's what with the board. Like professional poker players are fucking crazy. Yeah, okay. Um, but there is some there is a, a certain amount of luck because we don't know what card is going to be dealt, you know. Um, so you might say it's skill dealing with the luck, you know, is is uh, is part of what what powers poker. And, and I would say just as a general guess, you know, if you have complete um, chance luck over here and complete skill over here, the poker probably hovers with a nice balance somewhere in the middle because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have lasted so long if it, if it didn't, you right. know, that's, that's the reward for designing a game that's truly balanced is it, it lasts, you know, it just, it has appeal. Uh, people get value out of it and they keep playing it over and over again. Um, Okay, so it says there are certain elements of both chance and skill, uh, but which dominates the game? It turns out that the answer depends on how many hands are played. Now, isn't this interesting? And maybe this will be interesting to those of you working on the poker game. For a small number of hands, it is likely that one player will be dealt more winning hands than the others, giving them a luck-based advantage. If more and more hands are played, each player will end up with about the same total number of winning hands. And the focus of the game shifts to who can maximize the money that he earns from each winning hand. The game shifts to a game of skill. Isn't that interesting? So the probabilities push it from luck at the early stages to skill in the later stages. Um, this example illustrates the difference between a purely random game and what is called measured randomness where the nature of the random elements are known and can be planned for by the players. That's where the skill comes in, right? Each individual hand or die roll or spin of the wheel may be random, but with a sufficiency large number of them, the randomness decreases. Okay, um, all right, so let's hit a couple more of these topics. So completely random games with few exceptions, most games 
those whose winner is primarily determined by luck have at least some small component of skill. Modifying the mix between luck and skill is covered in chapter eight, chance and skill, finding the balance. Are there any games that are completely random with no elements of skill at all? Absolutely. Uh, there are two general kinds of games that involve pure chance, children's games and gambling games. That is not to say that all children's or gambling games involve no skill at all. Many of these games contain skill elements as well. But if you find a game that is pure chance, it is probably one of these two types of games. Now, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that children's games, you know, like we were talking about before, it makes sense that they might have a high level of randomness because, you know, the children might be delighted by the die roll and what they get, you know, the randomness of it. Uh, but also they're not very developed, uh, you know, in their experiences, so they would, can't make strategic choices. But what's really interesting about gambling is that gambling is based on, on a similarity to children's games. Because you would think, as I said, as you get older, um, you want, you know, your, your, your needs when it comes to gambling, your desires, I'm sorry, when it comes to playing games, they increase more towards the, the edge of skill. You know, you want what's called agency, which is the ability to control your fate, right? However, the interesting thing about gambling as we know it, casino gambling and everything, they want just the opposite, right? They don't want you to have any stake or as little stake as possible in controlling your fate because they want, they want you to play the type of games which favor the house overwhelmingly, you know, from a probability standpoint. And those are the completely or almost entirely random games because the probabilities do over time favor the house winning, you know, um, which is why, you know, gambling uh, is, is such a gamble, if you will. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, let's, let's finish off these last couple sections and then we'll go talk about your games. Uh, so children's games. Young children who have not developed the cognitive skill necessary to understand complex decision making in more strategic games enjoy the games of pure luck, watching what happens as the random elements collide. Ironically, many children will attribute this to their own skill in rolling dice or selecting the right cards. And if you've ever played, you know, games of skill, oh, you're rolling hot now, junior, you know, good, good roll, right? Yeah, encourage that. And they get happy that they rolled well when it's, you know, if you told them it was completely random and they had no, there was no uh, chance that they were affecting it in any way by blowing on it or rolling to the right or whatever, you know, it would take some of the fun away from the game, right? Right. Uh, uh, let's see. Examples include the board game Shoots and Ladders and Candy Land, the card games War and Old Maid, okay, Old Maid, uh, and the dice game Thunderstorm. Uh, la, 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 la. In these games, the decision making is rather limited. You do what the game tells you to do based on the random outcome. Luck games that appeal to children tend to have a level of building tension that is resolved by a random event, such as the wars in war or the more difficult rolls as the dice get fewer in Thunderstorm. Uh, they also allow sudden changes of fortune, such as the special spaces and shoots and ladders that cause a player to advance or fall back suddenly, or when a player draws the one dangerous card in Old Maid and is suddenly in a position to lose. Lastly, these games allow the possibility of always coming from behind and winning, so the end result is never certain. This is the purpose for the rule in shoots and ladders that requires two players to land exactly on the final space no matter how far ahead a player is, there's always a possibility that she'll keep rolling too high and another player will catch up and win. Compare the use of luck in these games to the use of luck in a game like Risk. In Risk, three cards of a kind or of a unique kind can provide the player with a progressively increasing number of units to add to her army. At a glance, this seems like a completely random mechanic. While the actual card the player receives may be random, when the player uses the cards and even the means of gaining cards in the first place is heavily dependent upon skill. So that's what I'm talking about when, you, when you're making games for adults or you know, even teens, uh, you know, older teens, uh, you, gotta, you have to include that skill along with the luck. Okay, uh, last two sections here, gambling games. The, the defining mechanic of gambling games is that real money is won and lost in the process. Without money at stake, pure luck gambling games quickly lose their appeal. Uh, and that makes perfect sense. Why would you play a pure luck game as an adult unless there was something riding on it, right? Um, some gambling games with no skill aspects are roulette, craps, and slot machines. It's interesting to note that most gambling games, even those that are pure chance, still offer choices. Players can choose a number to bet on in roulette. 
and are offered a choice of betting types in crafts and are even allowed to choose how many coins to play at a time from one up to three or five for many slot machines. Now, what this is doing, it's giving you the illusion of choice when really it's all probability, right? The game may still be completely random, but the element of choice gives players the illusion of control since different choices lead to different outcomes. What about games like poker? As known earlier, the more hands one plays, the less random it is. The substantial skill in poker, however, comes not from the draw, but from what the player does with the draw. What cards will he hold? How much will he bet? How good is his bluff? Each of these decisions in conjunction with the decisions of the other players factors in to create a skill-based play field versus a luck-based play field. Okay, last section. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, actually, I take it back. That was the last section. The rest is just uh, assignments to create games. Okay, let's switch over to talking about you guys and your games. So uh, who has got something uh, that we can look at, uh, either new cards or maybe something, a uh, new game board, a uh, new layout and tabletop simulator, what you guys got to show us? No, uh, it's not much, but I'm starting to make a redesign for the characters that we have for mythology. So Cthulhu right now is what I'm working on. And I already showed a Creed and the rest of the, my teammates this. And hold on, let me see. I'm gonna send it to Discord real quick. It looks so cool. I'm so excited. And I didn't get to finish coloring it right now because we're in class. Do you wanna just share your screen, Eduardo, and, and show it to us? Yeah, I yeah, am right, real quick. Uh, let me just go here. It's because I still because today I'm gonna go to West Campus to do that Adobe thing finally because I don't know what was going on with their phone numbers, but I got it already so I just nice. gotta go today. Okay. Um, share my screen and you guys can see right. Yes. Yep. So this is I'm not done with the coloring so this is what I've got because the the one that we had before. Uh, the full body skill that I made for it, it was like more of a chubby version of the Cthulhu. And I thought to myself, like, maybe I should just make him more like a monster than more yes. of a humanoid. So cool. Because um, I got, I was looking up a bunch of information on Cthulhu and Jesus, there's a lot of lore. Oh, yeah. Um, I saw, but this one caught my eye, this video called Smite. And it had Cthulhu on it, and I just looked at it, and they were talking about him as, like, you know, a playable character, and I was like, okay, cool. And then he looks so cool in that game because he's the Deep Dreamer. I think that's what his nickname is because his powers are basically giving you insight and sanity, which ends up you killing yourself. But in that um game, he was he looked exactly similar to this. He was just basically a giant coming after everybody, and... I was like, why did I look at this again? I was like, okay, this caught my eye. So I was thinking, maybe if I should do a redesign, maybe players would be able to come see this and say, oh, that looks cool. I want to play that. Yeah, right. Just like seeing the cool characters would draw them to it. Because it is so eye-catching. It looks so cool. Mm -hmm. And I really like this a lot because I was just thinking, and I was looking at Call of Cthulhu and some other video games. And they always just imagine this giant beast of a monster. So this is, that's just what I was going for. And, and every time I looked at him, he just had a bunch of wrinkles a little bit, <laughs> yeah. mostly. So I couldn't, I tried fitting it in with his arms. And that's the best I can do. <laughs> I like it. It looks sick. Yeah, it looks great. And uh, it's, it's really nice to know that you did all that research. I think research is really fun because you, you know, you learn things, you expand your knowledge but can also be really inspirational. Like it sounded like you got some insights into this guy's personality. And so you wanted to draw him in a certain way. Yeah, because there's this one video that showed me is like everybody, when you see Cthulhu, you're thinking of like, oh, there's it's a face, right? Body has to have like wings, has to have tentacle face, red eyes. And so, yeah, <laughs> when you see something like this, you're like, oh, that's Cthulhu. Cool. Yep. Very so, nice. Yeah. And this is just the beginning because I do want to do a lot of good redesigns since like my other ones were just like cropped off because of the computer swap. 
Oh, right. 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 Well, at least you're finally getting that uh, resolved, hopefully. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like after class, I'm literally going to go and then like get to just install Adobe and stuff like that. Nice. Oh, brilliant. That's cool. Um, all right, cool. And then uh, anything else from you guys on that game? Yeah, or? I can show you something that we've got, like this, the, some of the changes we've made in tabletop. So let's see. Okay. Cool. Can you guys see? Yes. Very nice. Okay, cool. So yeah, we got still, um, I'm wanting to um, change the table and everything, but that's going to kind of be later, like one of the last things we end up doing. But then I was also thinking about the suggestion that you had made, Greg, about getting uh, like player mats, uh -huh. like making player mats and then enemy mats, because I think that would be really cool to put right here. Be really interesting for the fights and stuff. But yeah, so we have like the stat cards and everything. We'll draw like 10 of these. And then, oh yeah, yeah, okay, this is also what, I, I'm just like so overwhelmed. There's so much I wanna show. So um, how does the font look for the, like the numbers? Does it stand out too much? Does it look good? What do you guys think? I think it looks good. Uh, I, I think that the A, the H and the S uh, should probably also be in this font. In that same font, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's too hard to read otherwise. Right, right. And then should I, do you think like the coloring is, does that look good? Like keep it the coloring red, green, and blue, and then just change the font? Well, you could do one of two things. Um, uh -huh. Change the font and see if it stands out enough. And okay. If it doesn't do something like, you could put like a white circle behind each number and then you could screen it back a little bit, but just oh. make it pop out. Yes. Okay. I see what you mean. Yeah, I'll definitely try that. So thanks for that feedback. And then we also got these in here now. So the event cards are now scaled up to four players. And then um, I also took Jazz's advice, which I didn't even realize I had done, but once he pointed it out, I was like, oh yeah, that's perfect. So um, yeah, they, the enemy, the fights scale for how many players are playing and then the rewards scale as well. So if you're playing with one player, he that he or she gets one card, two players, everyone gets two cards, three players, everyone gets three cards and so on. So we have all these different uh, events for the, so this would be like a one, like just the first event. So this is gonna be like kind of an easier battle. Hey, and then Chris, this would uh, be, go, yeah. Go back, go back to that card. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, do you see the column of text on the right? Yes. Can you move that over so you have the same amount of space between the edge of that text and the and the, the yes like definitely yeah okay. I will definitely and then I even wanted to like see um because I like this blank space at the top of the card is like really jarring and I wanted to maybe try to put some kind of picture there like maybe a battle field or something since it's going to be an event card like to have a little battle going on there would be kind of cool just some kind of picture so it's not just blank. Yeah, and uh, and by the way, Jazz says, um, I, I oh, think, yeah, I think he might have been referring to the last card where you were trying uh -huh. to figure out how to get the numbers. He said in the, in the uh, thing in the in the chat, hey, I just did a bunch of text in white and put a black drop shadow three by three hundred and it really popped the text out. So, oh, sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely try that then. That'll and that'll help because, yeah, that was like those letters at the bottom were definitely the ones that were I was having trouble making them stand out. So thank you guys. I'll definitely do that. And then, yeah, I'll fix this text. Yeah. This was kind of just still a rough draft card, but yeah, definitely need to move that text over to the left a little bit, but yeah. And then, yeah, this is just uh, what was this like a three? Yeah. So this is like a three event card. So for four players, you would fight four of these mini mix, three armored humans, and then you all get four stat cards. And then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just kind of fixed some text. Finally, made all these uh, scaled event cards and everything. Yeah, it, it looks great. I mean, uh, thank you. The graphics that you're working on and things like Eduardo's doing are really nice. Yeah, I'm like really excited. When he, it, when Eduardo sent us that redesign, I was like, oh yeah, that looks so awesome. If you want, we can try to, uh, like, just for the final draft at least, try to implement all of those once we're. Once at least we have everything playable, because like those that redesign was really cool. What's this stuff over on the edge of the table here? 
Lit. Oh, this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, these are the stat cards. So this is the stat card deck. And you at the beginning of every game, you would draw um, 10 cards. So then yeah, you have like, this is an attack boost card. And then this is like a mutation, like a kind of like I was talking, we were talking about like in the very beginning where this would then, like you could use this card once and then it would just be like, okay, now you lose 100 strength, which would be attack and gain 200 health. And that's like a permanent debuff of your attack and then a permanent buff of health. And then the rest of these are just the stat cards that you can use throughout the game. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Very nice. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Okay. So Coulter says, I haven't gotten any new art done, but I'm working on it. Okay. You saw some of your art on Monday and it looks really good. Yeah. It looks awesome. Uh, let's see. How about over in, in, uh, Jazz and Livia, do you guys have any any new stuff that's been done or? Um, I have. I need some feedback for my cars, my car game. Your toxic game. No, I I need some feedback. Yeah. For my car game, I put some graphics in my folder. Okay, let me see if I can find those. Uh, so. Uh, okay, let me see if I can find your folder here, Livia. Uh, hmm. All right, gotta go to my Pima email. There it is, and then drive. Okay, search for Livia. Okay, and then we got the. G A M one hundred one. There it is. Okay, so now I can share my screen. Share, share. Okay, so it's in the card game folder. Uh, I put them outside. Uh, I okay. want to say, um, can you open the the one that is a copy of New Jumbo back character card? All right, so yeah. Olivia would like some feedback from you guys on uh, this. What do you guys think of this card here? That, that looks pretty cool. That one size. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs> I think it looks really good, actually. Uh, and what were you saying, Olivia? Uh, there are going to have to be two sizes of cars. The character cars are going to be Jumbo, and the other cars are going to be poker size. Okay, so jumbo for the character cards and poker size for the regular. Yes, and this is the one for the character, and the other is the other is that is silver is the regular poker card that is for all the other things. Okay, so, so that is the jumbo character, and then this mm -hmm. is the regular poker size card. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is example of how the characters are going to look is the one that say copy of character one. Wow. What do you guys oh, think of this? That's so awesome. I like, I love the, it? yes, I love it so much. I love the character model and I really like how um, with the back of the cards, you manage to get the new font, like the new font and the logo works so well with the art deco style still. It looks really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is the, the character car. I tried uh, different ways to paint it, but as the front is metal, I'm trying this way. Uh, I I don't know if, if you like it. I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's it doesn't just go with the theme, you know, the sort of, uh, Gatsby-esque Art Deco theme, but it's just a beautiful piece of art in its own. So all the characters are going to look this this way. So it is. It looks good. Yeah, in fact, yeah, I like it. In fact, I'd like to make the point that you know, um, you know, we don't talk often enough about game design as art, but it really is an art and a science. And I think that if you do something as beautiful as this in your game, 
uh, it's going to add to the appeal of the game because, you know, not only is it a fun looking game that's, you know, nice to play, but it's just got beautiful appealing art to it, which is a big hook, I think, for people. Yeah, and, seriously. And do you think that is, I want the, the front of the, the characters and all the cars uh, with a clean background, white, not, uh, <laughs> not cluster like this. Do you think it's, uh, it's fine with the other side of the, of the car that is black and have all that design? Do you think that it combines all together? Well, one, one suggestion I have is like, if you, mm -hmm. took, if you took this, um, this background design out of here, maybe you could mm -hmm. do something like a gradient of color in the back, mm -hmm. you know, maybe something like, you know, a light purple to white or something like that. And then you could have your text, um, okay. whatever text would be on this card. Okay. There is another uh, that's, that says character 1B. I eliminate the back, the bottom design. Uh huh. Can you open it, please? Yeah, I've got it open. Uh, you know, they're both the same. Uh, no, they no, don't have the bottom line. lines. Oh, that doesn't have the bottom line. Okay. Um, so you want our opinions if we like this better than the other one? Uh, which one do you prefer? I, is is there going to be any choice that's not going to have this design at the top, or is it always going to have that design? I like to have that design. Uh, okay. Maybe maybe not in that position. I can change it because that is part of the front design. <laughs> Yeah, These the lines, the, the little lines that are behind everything. Right. So that, that connects the back of the card to the front of the card. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it looks great. And then would, would text appear over here on the right? I'm not deciding. I guess um, I'm going to put in the, in the upper and the, the gold line I'm going to reduce and go in the same... <laughs> Go together at the same size of the geometrical okay. design. Nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it could work with the white background or it could work with a colored background. But if it were colored, it would have to be very light yeah. or, or a gradient. Um, so I would, I would just try throwing a couple of different light or gradiated colors on there and see which one works best. Yeah, because I was thinking like, I just love the... Like I like this one without the bottom lines and just like mm -hmm. the uh, just this artwork is so cool and the contrast with just the bright white background I really like it so yeah even just like blank white like this looks awesome and like just like Greg was saying earlier too like it's just such beautiful artwork it's nice to look at when you have when you're playing the game the whole time to have cool artwork to look at yeah very nice and Thank and when you, you uh, when you design yeah. like the box. If uh -huh. you design a box for this game, you should definitely consider using some of this type of artwork on the front because it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, but do you like do you like this style? I do. Okay. I do quite a bit. Uh, yeah, Jazz Thanks. says fits the art style. Love it. The contrasts actually play well into themes of hidden agendas. And Coulter says the textures as coloring is always really cool looking. So thank uh, you. Very nice. Okay, cool. Can't wait to see that game. Um, all right, so what else have we got? Um, anything else from you, Olivia, or is that it? Oh, wait, your, your microphone. Yes, I noticed, I noticed. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm going to unlock the others because uh, I was want to be sure that the style was good. Okay. Before. But I have everything, <laughs> but only have to put the texture. Can, can, we, can we look at the other ones or not? No, I have to upload it. Oh, you have to upload them. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Um, well, do you want to do you want to do that, and we'll come back and look at it, or do you want to do it for another day? Or uh, your mic's gone. Let me see if I can upload that because I'm having trouble with my internet. Okay. Okay, we'll give you a second there.
Okay, while we're uh, waiting on this, uh, is there anybody else who's kind of on deck to show us some stuff? Anybody else who have cards or maps or anything? Jazz, you can you can show us some stuff next. Okay, great. Um, hey, Livia, do you want do you want us to look at Jazz's stuff and come back to you? I can't hear you. <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll come back to you. All right, uh, Jazz, okay. you don't have a microphone but I'll stop my share and then you can uh, share and show us what you want, Jazz, and then we'll come back and look at Livia's cards. Nice. Wow, that's a big improvement. So those are the characters. Uh, Creed says, I love these cards so much. Yeah, that is really great looking. And then there's that card with the blue tower that you like so much, Jazz, and the fog. Uh, Nick likes the cards as well. I like these little, I like these little shapes. It almost, it looks like the little Chevrolet logo at the bottom, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I like I like those little shapes that are holding the information about the cards. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I like those a lot. Very attractive. Definitely makes the game a lot more appealing. Okay, uh, I think that might have been it for Jazz, but. Um, Looks really good, Jazz. Uh, you guys keep up the good work. Definitely, uh, it's getting better every time. Um, okay, so how are we doing, Livia? Do you need more time? You want us to check in with other people, or let's see? I think Livia is. Yes, I need a little more time. A little more time. Okay. Uh, anybody else have anything to show us? All right. Um, Livia, instead of like rushing to do this now, would you rather just show us on, on Monday? I think she's probably off trying to uh, get- No, I'm, I'm here. Okay. You want to show it to us on Monday? Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, double checking, uh, last call. Anybody have anything to show us? Stop it. What's that? No? Okay, um, so I'm not really hearing anything. So I think what we'll do now is we'll switch over to having you guys work with your teams. Uh, keep in mind, we do have a deadline and it's two weeks from today. So what I could recommend to you guys is, yeah, I know it's rough. Um, what I can recommend to you guys is if there's parts of your game where the artwork isn't finished and you're like not moving forward on your game because of that, like not testing it and stuff, then maybe get around that roadblock by just taking just placeholder art and you know writing the name of whatever the hell it's supposed to be and throw it in a tabletop simulator, start playing the game, you know, have have you know one person or a couple people start play testing the game, have somebody else working on the art. Have somebody else working on the rules if, if you have that kind of personnel available to you um and you know have everybody working in conjunction but maybe i work on different aspects of the game so you can move the whole thing forward at the same time instead of everybody waiting until the art's done to move forward you know that way you can get some play testing done between now and your deadline you can certainly get artwork done and 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 if two weeks pass and you know, nine, you know, eighty percent of your game is done, and some of your game is just blank placeholder cards. We're okay with that. You know, we 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 just want you to get your game to the point where we can experience it, play it, and give you some feedback. So don't stress about it being a perfect game in two weeks. Just just get a playable game, 
in, in whatever fashion you can and then and and do the best you can with everything else. Right. I know it's like I was thinking about um, when Eduardo was showing us his new art, I was like, yeah, dude, just keep making that. And even worst case scenario, we'll just add it in the final draft or something because it's just so cool. Yeah, I mean, this this deadline in two weeks, it's not the last chance you're going to get to work on the games. Right, right. It's just, it's just the first opportunity we're going to have to play a draft version of your game, right? Okay, so why don't you guys get together in your teams or work as individuals uh, if you're a solo developer and, uh, and make some progress on your games and hopefully have some new stuff to show us on Monday, okay? Um, I want to ask just a quick question. Yeah. What are we going to be doing? Um, you have a class next semester, right? Because I'll be continuing this course and stuff. There's another one after this, right? Yeah. All right. Um, after the deadline kind of happens, what are we going to be doing after that? If just kind of keep learning about different articles and stuff you find? I don't know. Well, in, in this class, um, what we're going to do is we're going to move into some really simple online games. Um, we're, right. going to, we're going to make like a text, like a sort of a text-based adventure game um, using uh, something software called Twine. Um, and uh, it's pretty powerful software though. You can, you know, uh, you can make a text-based adventure game where people get to make choices about where they want to go next, but you can also add in music, animations, graphics, you can do coding. So it's a really great um, bridge between the, uh, between the physical world of, of cars and board games and what you guys will be learning later in the program, which is you know programming and art for video games. So All right. we'll be transitioning into that. Okay. Um, wow, that sounds so cool. That's the like game design too, essentially? No, 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 that's in this class. Oh, oh sick. Yeah, in this class, we're just going to do that. And that's going to, um, you know, the next couple of the next classes that you take, um, there's two classes that people often take together in the next semester. One of them is a class that teaches you about uh, storytelling in games and narratives and things like that. And the other actually starts you on programming. And so a lot of people take those two classes together um, in the next semester so that they can, you know, learn more about game theory and, and narrative and stuff, but also just get their, their uh, feet wet and start, you know, working on actual games. So very cool. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So why don't you guys work on your games? I'll, uh, I'll turn off my video, but I'll still be here. Uh, if you guys have any questions to ask me.